Event-based APIs become more and more popular and async API is one of the big things that is a player in that space. And with us today is Fran Mendes, the creator of async API. Hey Fran, how are you doing? Hey Eric, nice to be here and thanks for inviting. Okay. Yeah, thanks for joining. And you're here for a very good reason because a new version, a new major version of Async API is getting released on December 6th, uh, Async API version 3. Um, Async API has been around for seven years now. We just looked it up. The last major version has been around for four years, so it has been a while in the making. Uh, what would you say were the main reasons or motivations to start working on a new major version? So, yeah. Last uh, major release was in September uh, 2019, but um, we didn't actually start the working on version 3 straight away. Uh, we were working on version 2.x versions until very recently last year. So, but like two years ago, we, we noticed uh, about a few pain points when working with ASIN KPI, right? So, and we started thinking about what's the, the best way to solve them. So it's been like uh, around two years working on, um, on let's say three major things that I would say, which is one of them is uh, solving the publish and subscribe confusion. <laughs> that's, a, that's a classic. <laughs> that's a classic, yeah. Like people have been uh, getting, even myself, eh, all the time, continuously. Like I was writing this in KPN, and I was like, uh, is it publish or is it subscribe? Uh, and I was like, oh, damn, we got to get rid of this because it's confusing even for us. So, so yeah, uh, we changed that. So now in version three, you will find that there's no publish or subscribe anymore. And it's send and receive. So we just, we didn't just change the name just to clarify because that will still be confusing, right? But uh, we also changed the name so that it becomes more... Um, how can I say it becomes more evident that there has been a change, right? In the perspective of publish and subscribe. So before it was from the perspective of the, uh, let's say what you can do with the application that you are defining. So yeah, so that was highly confusing for broker-based architectures and so on, and which accounts probably for 90% of the use cases of facing KPI. Thing. Yes, it does. And, and, and I'm sure everybody will uh, be very thankful that this has been uh, cleaned up and now there is like a different terminology around that. So, okay, that's, that's definitely a breaking and a, and a useful change. Um, what's the second thing that you would say is one of the major things that had been addressed? So, yeah, another one that I will highlight is that uh, the drift a little bit from open API structure. So the structure of the document um, started as a copy, literal copy of OpenAPI. That's how I did it. And, um, and also as a, um, how, can I, how can I frame that? It was also trying to stay as compatible as possible with OpenAPI, not just in uh, schemas and so on, but also let's say in the structure of the document. So it was easier for people to, to land and learn the document and learn async API and so on. But over time, we noticed that uh, um, we had to keep evolving in another direction. And uh, in this case, with publish and subscribe, um, we had to replace publish and subscribe, but we were also noticing that um, people wanted to share channels among async API files. So this is something that usually doesn't happen on open API. You have a path definition, there's a single document with a path definition and inside the path definition, you have multiple uh, verbs, right? Uh, and that's it, it's in this document. This is the source of truth, right? But in the case of facing KPI and in the case of event-driven architectures, the channel is a shared resource across multiple clients, right? It's something that usually lives in the broker, right? So it's not owned by any client, right? So when you want to define it in one place, in one document, uh, and you have to define it in another document, the same channel, you don't want to repeat yourself, right? You want to reuse as much as possible. But it wasn't possible because the verbs, publish and subscribe, were inside the definition of the channel. So if you put the verb here, 
then here you cannot use it because it should be the opposite, <laughs> right? So I, we, we, we will not be able to reuse it. So we, we're we right now like drifting a little bit from OpenAPI because of this reason. And now, op, uh, and now I think API is a little bit more, uh, it's, it's decoupling um, channels and operations. So operations became a first class you present in, in async API. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, in the end it's, it makes sense anyway. I mean, open API also changed its structure when going from open API two to open API three, and it yeah. will do the same thing going to open API four. Right. So I guess in the end, right. it's yeah. kind of an, a natural thing for those things to diverge Actually, a little bit. Actually, there were discussions of following the same. Uh, um, I remember in Open API of following this kind, the same kind of uh, structure on, on Open API. I can't recall what is it, but there was a conversation about it, and um, you know, like making operations uh, first class in in Open API, so putting them on the root level of the document instead of inside the path definition. Yeah, but I don't know how did it go. <laughs> well. At the very least, it didn't happen. So, yes, I think <laughs> so this is how that was rebuilt. Okay, so that was number two, kind of changing the structure a little bit based on use cases, which is definitely a good idea. And then number three of the big changes that you would uh, highlight for async API three, what would that be? Request reply, no doubt. So, uh, <laughs> no doubt, this is a, a big change. So. Uh, for for years, um, users have been asking us to to give support to be able to publish a message on a on a queue, for instance, and then you receive the reply of that message uh, on another queue or on another topic, right? In this case, channels in this API. So we modeled that, right? And um, we modeled that into a we baked this into a in KPI. And now it's possible. You can have request reply. You can have uh, you can define different kinds of replies. So there are replies that you that you know upfront at the design time where the replying is going to be. Is it going to be on channel X or channel Y? So you can pass it there. But you can also specify that I don't know where the channel is going to be. This is going to be decided at runtime. And um, but you can find this information on the reply to header, for instance. So there's going to be a reply to header of the message that will tell you where to put the reply. So there is where you have to look at, right? So that's also possible that you define it like this. And um, and yeah, and it opened a, a new possibility as well because uh, because of async API is not tied to any specific protocol, uh, but still supports HTTP somehow, not as well as, as open API, right? Um, so it's opening a new possibility now that is like, it's now possible to define a REST API using this in KPI, which I find it uh, funny somehow because <laughs> there's a bit of overlap now in between uh, Open API and this API. But yeah. Yes, and I, you know, that's a whole different conversation. I really would like to go in in, in <laughs> great detail, but let's not do that today. But it's interesting <laughs> to see that at least now, like conversation patterns, so to speak, um, yes. make a little bit of an appearance in, in yeah. async API. So that's cool. Okay, great. So these are three interesting changes. Now, of course, let's very briefly talk about why would, should somebody want to migrate from older, older, from the current version of async API to the new one? What would you say would be typical motivations why people might be motivated to say, oh, there's a new version. I want to, I want to make the switch. Cause it's the latest one, right? So you gotta be up to date. No, <laughs> no really. We, we often tend to say, to say that if you don't really feel the need to upgrade, just don't do it. We're not going to be pushing hard on people to, uh, Hey, you have, you have to adopt version three. No, it just, uh, be wary that there is there are these th new things, right? Like this request reply. There's this new structure and and publish uh, and subscribe um, semantics, right? That makes it easier for you to work with this in KPI. So if you can, if or if you're gonna start working in a new project, then um, adopt this in KPI three, of course. 
that's my that's my recommendation. If you have something already, if you're really invested into uh, V2 and you don't need any of these new features and you don't suffer from this pain, just keep on working on V2, right? That's completely fine. So we're not gonna we're not gonna deprecate V2 anytime soon. This is gonna be well maintained for years, uh, or at least that's our hope, right? Uh, that we our community our community keeps maintaining it over the years, even if we are not uh, around, right? One last thing that I think is all, also always interesting when it comes to new major versions is how quickly will you see support from tooling and vendors and all these things, right? That mm -hmm. depending on what you're doing and how much users are asking for support, right? It's sometimes it, it's surprisingly quickly, sometimes it's surprisingly slow. So how do you see that happening? Of course, it's not really under your control, but I'm just wondering, do you have any idea, you know, how that may play out? Yeah, so so you're right. We don't have it fully under our own control, uh, but we do really have something on our control and it's the tooling, at least the tooling that we produce, right? So we we maintain tooling on, uh, on Async API, a bunch of them actually. So, so yeah, our tools are, at the time as you're publishing this video, it's already migrated and it's all supporting version three. Actually, it's already there. We, every time we release a new uh, major version, let's say, we make sure that it's uh, supported by tools. We also try to do it with minor versions, but because it's easy as well, it's easier, but um, sometimes it's, you know, tooling, takes a little bit of time to, to catch up, maybe two, three months, something like that. But, um, but yeah, we maintain tools. So we're gonna, we're gonna update them always. Um, so whenever we release a new major version, you can actually use it immediately um, and not just like see a text document that it's beautiful, but you can do nothing with it, right? So <laughs> as a user, right? So, so yeah, that is, uh, that is one thing. The other thing is that vendors, so we cannot control what vendors will do, right? But we can definitely uh, help this change to, to happen, right? So what we're gonna be doing for, uh, from now on is that, uh, which we already started actually, um, is we're gonna be helping vendors to adopt the new SMGPA version. And there are a bunch of uh, things that, or initiatives that we're doing here. One of them actually is the, is the new parser version. So our new parser, um, the API that we designed for our new parser uh, takes this into account. So what it's, what it's doing is that it's abstracting the async API document structure from your logic, from your business logic of your application or your product, right? So if you if the vendor integrates or uses our parser, um, what will happen is that in future uh, versions, major versions of the spec, they will most likely ninety nine percent won't have to update their code at all. They will just have to uh, upgrade to the latest version of the parser, and it will work with version four of the API, version five, version six, and so on. Of course, not with the new features. Uh, they will have to implement those. But uh, with existing features, let's say, and functionality, it will work. Right? So, so yeah, we're, we're working on parsers like, like this, on the JavaScript and TypeScript parser right now, but we plan to expand to multiple languages because we're actually exploring how to generate the parser uh, automatically from the JSON schema definitions that we have for, for, the, for the, I mean, semi-automatically. Semi from the JSON schema definitions that we have for, uh, for SMKPI. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's an interesting problem, right? I mean, you definitely see that in the open API space right now a little bit where like support for open API 3 is still not quite where you would want it to be. Yeah. And um, and I think, you know, the, the added complication there, I think is that by now people use API descriptions as input for a whole bunch of tools. And if, if, if only one of these tools, right, doesn't support the new version, then you kind of have a problem with, okay, what do I do right. now? And, and so, so it really becomes 
like the more success you have, so to speak, right, the trickier it becomes a little bit to make sure that the whole landscape is actually progressing. But I, but I think what you're doing there is actually quite an interesting and a smart way of trying to make sure that, of course, it's not going to be fully automatically, but I think you make it as easy as possible. Exactly. So, so think about it. Like um, vendors usually need a reason to upgrade, right? Their businesses usually. So if there's no uh, people asking them to migrate uh, and upgrade to the latest version, why will they, right? So, so we can we can play two hats here. We can play the you know we can be wear the hat of uh, we're here to help you to support you and uh, you know like um, so it's as easy as possible for you. And, uh, and also, we don't want you to change a lot of your code. That's why we're putting effort into the uh, parser API, right? And, um, and on the other hand, on, on the other side, let's say we can play the other, uh, we can wear the other hat, which is like, okay, you don't want to migrate. Uh, we're going to get them convince our community to put, to put pressure on you because we're going to release a bunch of uh, tools, super cool tools to do super cool stuff with the latest versions that then people will be complaining to you because you don't support the latest version, but other tools do, right? So it's a mix. It's a balance. Right? It's a mix, it's a, yeah. Yeah, it's a mix. But I think, you know, like you said, if you make it easy, <laughs> easier for them to do the upgrade work, yeah. right, by, by taking over a little bit of the effort, so to speak, right, it's also just becomes a different thing economically. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, no, that's okay. That's actually, I think, really interesting and, and good news. So I'm curious to see... You know, if we if we did that again, let's say in about a half year, right? It's like where would we be in the adoption curve? Um, we'll we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. But for now, I mean, so so thanks so much for joining, and I I think it's going to be interesting for a lot of people to check it out. And and once again, uh, on behalf of the entire ASIC API community, thanks for taking care of the publish subscribe thing. <laughs> <laughs> no problem i did it for me <laughs> <laughs> but for everybody else as well so yeah. that's great uh, so yeah so so once again thanks so much for joining from thank you for inviting yeah and thanks everybody for watching if you found it interesting please give it a thumbs up consider subscribing and i will link um, some resources from the description so that you can check out more things including the release notes once everything goes live, which will be on December 6th, 2023. Okay. Thanks everybody once again and have a great day and keep getting APIs to work. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.